Hello friends and sunflowers, my name is Lena. Welcome to my channel. Today we're going over the fourth chapter of the webtoons. As usual, please no spoilers in the comments for future chapters. If you do post a spoiler, please tag it as a spoiler for future chapters. I'm reading each chapter by chapter and I'm not reading ahead each week, so Yes. Obviously, in this video we will be discussing chapter 4, so spoilers for that, I guess. I assume you've already read chapter 4 if you're here. I just want to say that the web novel is out for free only in every other language except for English and Spanish because they're hosted on Wattpad. Still. Anyway! <laughs> so I have just been unlocking them with the free coins that you get by watching ads. If anyone was wondering. As usual, let's start with Chaco. Um, I'm actually going to start with the Chaco webtoon this time around because the web novel version actually has like extra stuff for the first time, <laughs> which is really exciting. But I cannot start talking about the webtoon without freaking out about the song Stay Alive. It is so good. Oh my gosh. When I saw that it had an audio thing, I was like, oh, volume up on my phone, turn it up as loud as I can. This song is embedded in the webtoon, so if you have your audio on while reading it, then the song will just automatically loop for you. And wow, not only is it like a masterpiece, but like they nailed the vibe here. Like Yoongi, as always, Jungkook, it fits the mood so well. And I would believe it if you told me that this artist was drawing this chapter while listening to this song because it just fits so well. <laughs> I think the song officially comes out on the 11th, which is pretty soon, which is nice because that means I won't have to stream it using the Webtoon app. Because <laughs> right now when I open Spotify, the only thing that's under Stay Alive is a Hamilton soundtrack song and I love the Hamilton soundtrack, but it's not what I want right now. <laughs> Anyways, let's get on to the actual story. <laughs> So this time around it focuses on Dogun and it literally doesn't mention like Haru or Zeha at all. Um, and it is following um, like his past and how he gets up to the events of the end of the previous chapter. And I have to say, I know, I just like last time I was like, hey, I can't wait for all these details. I love to see like how they um, lost their loved ones, but wow. This was a hard chapter to read. I mean, I was excited, don't get me wrong, but I was also like, oh my god, are you kidding me right now? I feel bad because I'm so excited. Anyway, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. So first, we actually get this opening shot of the city, and I want to talk about this for a moment. First, I just love that it starts off with containers. Like, there's this whole bottom part where it's like containers, uh, like, it reminds me of the container city that was in Namjoon's arc in the previous story. Now, I don't think that this is a container city. I think this is just, like, train containers. But the fact that they used it and, like, it makes me think of the previous, like, you know, Save Me webtoon story and I Need You era type thing. I feel, I, it's the small things for me, you know what I'm saying? Again, I don't think this is actually where people live. It's just a storage area, but I like it. I also really like how it's juxtaposed with like the city in the background. Um, kind of makes me think of like, where it's like, this is the slums, this is the rough side, you know, the one that Zeha was talking about earlier. And then in the distance, always looming, is all of the rich people, all of the money. It's like in there, in the distance, it's right there, but you can't access it. I like what they did. Also, side note, I love the architecture on the like buildings in the distance actually <laughs> like they have like standard like block of buildings but then at the top of them they've kept like their traditional korean um architecture and i'm just like wow you know i i don't know if that's actually a smart idea or not but i particularly am really interested in that i think it looks really nice i'm like you know what that keeps the like korean feeling like it doesn't feel like this is, could be New York. This feels like it's Korea because they've kept these traditional shapes. And I like that. Anyway, that has nothing to do with the story. I just I wanted to comment on the architecture. Like what an interesting way to design the city, you know? Props to that city designer. Anyways, 
the rest of the chapter. Obviously, previously, we've known that Dogen's character uses a lot of weapons, and we know that he has, like, access to a lot of weapons. We do get reasons as to why in this chapter. Actually, like, holy crap. <laughs> right at the beginning, he's literally taking out a person. Like, not, not a bum. A person. Several persons. This man does not play around. I mean, I think he's probably like an arms trafficker, which is what's going on here. Like this is a deal gone wrong. I'm guessing what they do is they steal weapons, like from armored vehicles, for example, and then they resell them like on the black market or whatever. So yeah, this is what has happened in this chapter is that people were gonna buy from him and they realized that he was doing it by himself and they attacked him, which obviously ended badly for them. <laughs> he kills them all. Wow. Like, don't mess with him. He, he takes this stuff seriously. Uh, but I do actually like that this event isn't just like, oh, look how good he is at with weapons. Look how, um, like, reliable he is. It's also that we later see this particular event really affecting him. Like, the fact that he knows how dangerous this is is not something he just like brushes off like you know sometimes they're just like eh, it's fine this is my job like he's just like yeah this is my job but he has like a visible moment where he's like shaking holding the picture of his friends as he remembers the person yelling like i don't want to die or whatever and i'm like holy crap like this is a very traumatic thing for him he does not actually enjoy doing this and i think this really shows a lot of character growth too like yeah obviously we see he's skilled and uh he looks really cool <laughs> in the moment and stuff like that so it accomplishes that but it's also something that gives us like a big character like re like in terms of his personality it reveals a lot about who he is as a person and it is a very like traumatic incident for him because yeah these people just tried to kill you for a weapon and again it's showing us that they're doing this because of the slums they don't have a lot of money they they have to be a little bit slimy in order to survive so yeah side note the guy who attacks him had like a red eye when he attacked him and so i'm starting to think that the like eyes having like colors in them is actually just a, an artistic thing Haru has glowy eyes because he's a rock, but maybe maybe the glowy eyes in the prologue aren't anything and it's just artistic stuff. But you never know! It could still be <laughs> magic related seven fates! Oh, side note, side note, um, there's a cat sitting outside of Dogum's apartment. I, I just wanted to mention that there's a cat. I see you, cat. Anyways, once he's in the apartment, we see, you know, the people that he likes. The people we know end up dying because of the last chapter. <laughs> and I kind of, I'm getting the, the impression, and then he also says this in the web novel later, but Dolgan sees these people as, like, a family to him. They're not just the people he works with. They're, like, he cares for these people. They're, like, his family. They're his very good friends. And he's even trying to get them out. Like, the next day is supposed to be their last job. I guess, as arms smugglers. Like, you know, the job that they're gonna do where they die. It's supposed to be their last job. And not only that, but it's on his birthday. I'm sorry, I'm yelling. Like, he even tries to get them to cancel it. He's like, you know what, let's not do this job. It's too dangerous, it's an armed vehicle. He just wants them to get out. Um, he doesn't want to put these people that he cares about in danger anymore. He was literally just attacked because of this job because people are desperate. And it's his birthday! Oh my god. Like, this pains me so much because they're like, not only that, but the, the reason that the other teammates want to do it for him is because he always takes care of them. Oh my god, I literally, oh! Anyways, they go behind his back to do this job, this last job, and they didn't know what kind of last job it was going to be. <laughs> This was so hard to read. I mean, obviously we know that it has to happen. Like, we knew going in that someone was gonna have to die by the bomb because that's what they told us all the way back when they were introducing this story to us that everyone lost their loved ones to the bomb but ouch they get attacked by the bomb taken out also some of the bomb are drawn like super massive i thought they were just like normal animal height but like what the guy who originally attacks these people is drawn like he's like a truck <laughs> anyway sorry dolan again um he literally is rushing there and then he comes to the scene of everything on fire and it's literally all of his worst fears coming to like reality coming to life 
and he doesn't get there on time. I feel like if he had been there, he had been able to, he would have been able to help prevent their deaths, which <sighs> hurts me a lot because can you imagine? Okay, but then also he has to witness the actual moment of death of one of his friends and I'm just like, oh my god. It literally makes him regret all of his life choices. He's like, I could have given you a better life that wasn't this and because of me making this decision to be an armed smuggler, now your death is on me. On his birthday! Oh my god! No wonder he's against the bomb. Like, I have no doubt that he's gonna take out the bomb here. Like, he'll be fine. <laughs> I mean, he's a main character, so of course he'll be fine. But, you know, he'll at least hold his own, right? Without worrying about getting, like, fatally injured. Ah, oh, but also just, like, remember he shook so badly at the idea that his friends would ever get hurt because of this line of work, and then they end up getting killed anyways? Oh my god, I literally, I can't. Sorry, this whole part is just me freaking out about this. This is traumatic for him, and I actually feel like this is gonna badly affect his mental state in the future as well, because, like, like I, like, I bet that this is gonna come up again. We know that he's going to end up joining Chako with, like, Zeha and Haru and everyone. But, like, this is what happened to his last team. And he carries that with him. A hundred percent. We've seen that. We, they've demonstrated that he carries these weights with him. Um, and I should mention that he was also, like, the chapter opens with him doing a dangerous job on his own. Because he strongly believes that he should be the one protecting the people that he loves, and that he, the people that he loves shouldn't have to do this kind of thing. And so, he almost feels like he would rather just be a lone wolf so that he doesn't drag other people into it, and it's also like a defense mechanism so that you can't be hurt again. He doesn't want to see people that he likes suffer. And if I were him, I would be reluctant to join a group after this. I don't know, I just feel like he would prefer to go it alone, like that lone wolf thing, like he had been doing at the beginning of the chapter. And obviously we know he does join, so will he, like, like I said, he's gonna carry this with him. Is he gonna be constantly worried about the others, especially at the beginning? Is he gonna be worried that they can't hold his own, their own? I, I feel like this is a really important thing for how, what we're gonna see with Dolgun in the future. Wow, he's just like one of the most resilient characters. I have respect for what this man has gone through and is going through and will go through. Also, do you think he's gonna participate in the training of Zeha or is that only gonna be Haru? Because he knows how to use a lot of weapons, right? So. Also, I just want to say, like, the fact that he uses ranged weapons might be because that way he can stay back and he can still see everyone so he can help people from a distance. <laughs> I'm sad. Anyway, now that we're sad, let's backtrack a little and talk about the uh, web novel. So we start out in the exact same place that the previous webtoon chapter starts off in. So chapter three of the webtoon is the beginning of chapter four for the web novel. This is nothing new. It's like some girl walking home from school and then she gets attacked by a bomb, Zeha comes in and tries to save her. Uh, there are some marked differences between the webtoon and the web novel. Um, they are different, but I think they end up achieving the same results, sort of. So, in the webtoon, first of all, the girl runs away at some point during the fight, like she's still alive. In the web novel, it mentions that she's decapitated, so I guess that she is dead. Second, while the events that happen to Zeha are largely the same, um, the, the lead up as to why these things happened is a little bit different. So uh, in the webtoon, um, he just kind of is doing it as a part of the way to try to like attack the bomb. Uh, he just kind of heads on in, I guess without much of a plan, and just like attacks the bomb to try to save the girl. However, in the web novel, He's made a deal with the tiger butterflies to attack these bomb. So he's like working with the tiger butterflies. I say working with. <laughs> That's what his impression was going in. And so basically they would get a share of the profits. So he's not just doing it by himself. However, obviously they take advantage of him. And Zeha assumes that they've probably done this to other people and that's how they've reached the top. Um, but yeah, they, they basically steal his kill and um, beat him up and leave him there to die or whatever, or just feel humiliated. Like they didn't help him at all, even though they had a deal um, until they could take the bomb for themselves. Here in the web novel, Haru is like, child, do you realize now why you need to be trained first? And I, this is a little bit different from the web novel. Like the way that Haru is speaking is just different. Like 
in the webtoon, it kind of felt like, oh, Haru's like, I was, I was assessing how you were doing. Uh, here, it feels like we've missed a conversation where Haru is like, I need to train you, and Zeha says no or something, and then goes with the tiger butterfly people. I mean, it does end up with the same thing, that he's probably going to end up training Zeha, but it does feel like it's a bit of a character difference, so I'm not sure about that, thought I would mention it. Anyways, character inconsistency aside, then we jump into Dogon's point of view. And again, here things slightly deviate from what happened in the webtoon. Not enough to be a different story, but you know, enough that it feels worth mentioning. So Dogon is late for their meetup, which is apparently something that he does regularly, which doesn't feel like it's in character to me, but you know, it's fine. And they're, they're telling him, hey, don't rush. So here, they, they didn't cancel the job. He didn't cancel the job. So in the webtoon, he had rushed to the scene, and in this one, he's just taking his time, and he just arrives, and he's like, wait, what's happening here? I feel like, like I said, this just tells us different things about his character, um, but achieves the same goal. So I don't know if he's just actually perpetually late or what, but either way, Dogon arrives at the scene after the bomb have already attacked, so there's nothing he can do to prevent it. So they achieve the same goal. However, in the web novel version, he sees two people die in front of his eyes. Kyungsu, and then again, Gayon, who dies in basically the exact same manner. She's half trapped under a car and can't move. And then we see that this is actually him reliving his trauma of that moment where they died, like it was a dream for him, he wakes up, it's a nightmare. Um, which actually might explain the like inconsistencies between the two, maybe it's just like that's how he was remembering it or something like that, but it's not necessarily what happened. But yeah, it achieves the same result for the most part, we're seeing that he's reliving these instances and it's haunting him. However, here in the web novel, they've actually gone ahead and spoiled us! We get an additional scene! So for whatever reason, this chapter is longer than all the others. It covers the webtoon chapters 3, webtoon chapter 4, and also has like an extra little bonus scene. Nice. So it cuts to the bomb Hupo, who if you remember is the one who hypnotized Jungkook and like got him to open the seal and stuff like that. And Hupo is with Maro, who is dissatisfied with the way that Hupo is doing things. Because basically he's like, hey, don't attack women, don't attack children, and don't attack people who are working hard. Which I don't understand why Hupo says that, but it's, it, it's interesting. And Maro is like, uh, I want to kill all humans because that person betrayed us however many hundreds of years ago and they were human and so I hate all humans and all humans should die. Clearly the bomb aren't listening to what Hoopo is asking them to not kill these people, which again I'm not sure why Hoopo is asking that because I'm pretty sure he killed a bunch of people to get to Zeha in the first place, but it's like they're not listening because we literally have two examples of people being attacked that are women or who are working hard <laughs> in the first place. Although, working hard might not necessarily mean that it's people who are stealing things. I don't know if that counts as working hard in their eyes anyways, so maybe not. But the first girl for sure was like attacked and she was like pretty innocent. Anyways, then he sort of senses that like there's someone visiting them or something like that, like an intruder or something, and Maro turns himself into fog. <laughs> Now the fog thing we've seen a bunch in the Hybe universe, and yeah, it does make me think of the Dark Moon, which we'll talk about when we get to that segment of this video. But basically, I think he can like turn himself into fog in order to attack this intruder. However, this intruder is um, stronger than him. I don't think they're a bomb, but they are something. And he gets deflected twice <laughs> and just like blown off. It's just like nothing to that person. And he's like, oh, how rude, you attack me, I just want to have a conversation. I don't think we're technically supposed to know who this person is yet at this point in time, but there are two things that are mentioned in this text that signal to me who I think these pers- these persons- <laughs> that signal to me who I think this person is. The first is that Maro th says that he's seen this person before, and second, that they are holding a black fan. So, in chapter 3 of the webtoon, there is a televised thing going on that starts off with the chapter where Huang Wun, which is the like chairman of the Yi Sel group, is the one who puts out the bounty. That's what happens at the beginning of chapter three. And this event also happens in the web novel, but this is a highly televised event. So reasonably speaking, it would be easy enough for him and many other boom to be able to recognize this person, to have seen this event 
take place, they obviously know that they're being hunted. Like, that's clear. So they must have at least seen this broadcast or seen mentioned of mention of the broadcast, but I wouldn't be surprised if Maro here has seen that broadcast because it was probably broadcast, like, everywhere. Everyone knows about it. The second thing, and this is, like, an art thing that specifically happened in the web uh, tune, and I thought it was so interesting because when, when Huang Wun is talking, He's talking using a fan, and it's very prominent in the art, as if it's a very important piece of, like, thing. So I, I kind of kept it in my head. I don't think I talked about his fan at all in the previous chapter that I talked about. But he's holding this fan, and it's so prominently drawn that it's actually, like, in the center of the frame. And so, to me, even though the fan is a different color, I think that this person is Huang Wun, in which case I'm a little bit concerned. But it also might explain why Hupo is like, don't attack women, don't attack children, don't attack people who are working hard. Because he wants to keep the infrastructure of the city in place, and he has a motive for it. Um, because he, because Huang Wun is talking to him. And Huang Wun is clearly very powerful if he can just deflect Mado like that. Because Mado, I think, is like his, like, Hupo's second in command. So he's like a fairly powerful bomb, I would assume. I mean, look, if you remember, in the last chapter, I said that I thought it was suspicious that the tiger butterflies had so much technology and they were so good at what they did, and I thought that it was a conspiracy. This is just adding to my theory about that. I think there is a conspiracy, you guys. There's <laughs> there's something going on here, okay? I really think that this is Huang Wun, and I don't think we're supposed to know it yet, but I'm pretty sure that's who it is. Just there's evidence pointing towards it just subtly. Just enough that you're like, not 100% sure, but I have a suspicion and I, I'm suspecting him. <laughs> so yeah, I think something's going on in the background there. Just a little bit and I'm very excited. <laughs> I'm really enjoying Seven Face. Can you tell? Okay, let's read a couple of comments that you guys left. Okay, so this comment is talking about how I said like Zeha's powers might be sealed or something. So they say, I feel like for Zeha, it's going to be something about him not being able to reach his full potential yet, or yeah, it being sealed for some reason. But maybe his parents uh, make sure that he wouldn't hurt anyone. I like the fact that you brought the parents into it because I just didn't really think about it, but maybe as a shaman, like his mother might have been able to lock away powers because she could walk, lock away the whole race. So who's to say she couldn't like lock away individual powers, you know what I mean? So yeah, I actually quite like that idea that maybe his mom or and his dad had something to do with the fact that he feels like he can't keep up with the other balm. Um, this person says, perhaps all the balm do not want to fight this war. If so, the balm may just be out and trying to live a life and hiding. So it could, ha so he, so he, being Joan, could have fallen in love with one who does not believe in war. After all, Zeha's mother fell in love with the balm, so it's possible that not all of them are bad, but the good and bad get locked up together. Okay, that's a hundred percent true. Definitely. Um, I guess it's just because it seems like a whole bunch of them want revenge, but some people are like, oh, well, it's not like the whole human race is guilty of this. It was just one person and there's bad bomb, there's good bomb, there must be bad humans and good humans. Like, you know, some people would probably logic that out. So yeah, you're right. That's probably what's happening. And I, I'm guessing that there's probably a nice bomb who Joan falls in love with. So the scenery is about to change because I have to go to work. And so let's talk about Dark Moon at night in the dark. Was it one hand or two? Hey, let's talk about Dark Moon. Okay, so with Dark Moon, we're gonna start with the webtoon today. As I predicted the last time, we're starting off exactly where we left off with Solon confronting Suha in the hallway, um, where he wondered, like, oh, do you know, do you even know my name? Uh, someone in the comments last time pointed out that. They mentioned that he seemed jealous. You were right, he is jealous. Second lead, hello. <laughs> I'm here for second lead Solon. Yeah, let's go. And obviously, she does know his name. <laughs> they said it several times. She also noticed something that I didn't realize reading the last chapter, that he was one of the people to pull her out of the way of the ball coming towards her so fast. I don't know how the heck she noticed that in the middle of everything, but like, Oh my gosh, his reaction when she said this was so cute. Solon is adorable. Like, his little blushies... 
adorable. If he's the second lead, well, we know what happens to second leads usually, which is just too bad, honestly. But I think he's cute. <laughs> he's like, don't be friends with us. We're gonna hurt you or whatever. <laughs> but then he sees her expression and he's like, you know what? Never mind. Do what you want. They're not gonna listen to me anyway. They're gonna be friends with you. So like, live your life. I love that. Solon is my new favorite character. Did I have a, a favorite character actually? I don't think I had a favorite character. Well, Solon is now my favorite character, thank you. Because I don't know who it was before, but it's him now. <laughs> also, I think Suha might have another power. One that affects vampires, maybe? I don't think it affects humans. Um, because all of the vampires are, like, really, like, they say, like, attracted to her. I wonder if this is related to the whole, like, dream thing that's going on in the web novels. And, like, this power could make sense as to why, like, Khan originally wanted to stop fighting because he saw Suha. That makes me think about maybe that's what's happening there. But it does definitely feel like an ability that she's not aware of. <laughs> Which we're gonna get get to um, for sure in this next part with the web novel. However, it, it, it's really interesting because they're feeling this and apparently, and it's been mentioned twice now, vampires don't have these kinds of emotions. Like they just, I don't know if they don't have any emotions or like they can't experience like love and attraction and stuff. So I don't know, I guess it's like a vampire thing. But the fact that she's making them feel emotions that they couldn't feel emotions before probably has something to do with her. Like that, love that, excited. Uh, personally, I would describe what they feel as like devotion, I'm guessing, because obviously she is their princess. And they're like, it's stronger than love. I think they say that at one point. And it's like, okay, well, what is stronger than love? Loyalty, loyalty and devotion. Like you would do whatever they ask for, which is another line they say. I don't know, it's just my thoughts. Suha's the vampire queen, let's go. Anyways, fast forward to the next day where she's finally going to attend school which is why she came to DeSales Academy in the first place. Except, of course, Heli is outside of her room ready to escort her to their lessons. And she basically gets to see, like, how popular he is. And she's like, oh my god, am I making you uncomfortable because I'm not popular? And he's like, oh, I thought I was making you uncomfortable. They're cute. I know I said I like Solon, but they're cute. And so far, I'm not seeing any, like, jealous girls lunging <laughs> at Suha, so that's refreshing. I kind of hope that there isn't any because I'm not really fond of that particular type of storyline. It's not my favorite. Anyways, Heli then straight up reveals to Suha that he can use telepathy and that they're like, oh yeah, you know, it's like, it feels like it's a trade-off because he saw her have her strength ability. So he's like kind of revealing his ability. And then he just says it's because he trusts her. Um, but it does kind of feel like it's like, well, you know what? You, you, you're self-conscious about this. So I'm going to show you why I, you know, why Solon acted the way that he did because we have this. So I, I, I feel like it makes sense. Like it's, um, like character wise, I think there's like a good reason for it beyond just the whole like devotion attraction thing. It's like, yeah, we're even now, you know, we're, we're even. And, um, web novel Suha seems to be very focused on like the whole we're even thing with the whole phone that she won't stop trying to pay back. So this feels like a similar idea, like this might be something that she cares about. Uh, so yeah, even this evens out the playing field a little bit. That's what I called my last video, right? <laughs> the blessed cursed one. Anyways, um, the chapter ends with them in the classroom and, um, Shion is like basically giving away, uh, Solon's seat to her so that she can, Suha can sit beside him. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously Solon's like, what the heck? So I'm excited to see where this is going. I have no idea where this is going at all, but I'm enjoying myself. I think it's really cute. Uh, let's talk about the web novel. We also start off continuing from last time where Heli pulls Suha out of the fog. She's obviously confused, as is everyone who is not Heli. <laughs> By the way, I am here for the amount of teasing that is going on towards Heli from the other members. Like, I absolutely love that. Super here for it. Real fun to read. Anyways, Heli actually explains a lot in this chapter, both about Suha and himself. So, first, apparently, Suha is the fog. I did not see that coming, but also, she is the fog. Hello, does that make you think of Chaco? I know I said I was going to bring it up. Here's me bringing it up. It makes me think of charcoal. Like, um, the bomb can turn into fog 
and like make parts of themselves corporeal, I guess, and they can also be like attack like it seems really similar ability wise. Um, and of course it makes me think of fever, which is a little concerning because fever in that fever music video, it's like the fog is coming for them. <laughs> like they're running away from it. If that's Suha, what the heck? Oh my gosh, like There's so much to think about. <laughs> Can you tell I'm really excited? I'm sorry. I have to calm down. <sighs> Anyways, um, with the fever thing, I kind of feel like in one dimension or another, it just, like, didn't work out for her. Or, like, something happened where they wanted to run away or they felt trapped. I don't know. Uh, anyway, Heli could tell that she was there because of his ability, which he goes on to describe. Obviously, he has the ability... Uh, of telepathy. He's the one who enables everyone to communicate with each other through their minds. So we get that dual telepathy reveal in both the web novel and in the webtoon. Awesome. But he also reveals that he can feel people's emotions, and if he particularly focuses on a person, he can kind of accidentally read their thoughts. So cue the moment where he accidentally focuses on Suha too much and reads her thoughts. Um, we also get a part where they compare Suha's strength to Yan's, and they basically decide that, yeah, Yan is actually stronger than Suha is overall. She's like, yeah, I could, you know, push a bus, but Yan can lift one up, you know? So that's that's good to know. I feel like that might be important in the future. <laughs> and while Heli never told us who, he did say there was someone who was like a living torch who can basically write, light things on fire or lighter or something. I don't know. He, he said someone can light things on fire. Obviously, this is Gino, Jake's character. They've already told us this in the intros. Interestingly, he wasn't actually mentioned as being like one of the characters who was apparently eavesdropping, but... Uh, we can just assume they're all technically eavesdropping, so I love that. Please, just keep teasing Heli. Forever. <laughs> it's like my favorite thing from the web novel. <laughs> I can't wait for it to start happening more in, like, the webtoon, because I, ho I really hope it they keep that. I love it. <laughs> Anyways, the chapter ends with Heli asking if Suha can turn into fog again, to which she's like, I don't even know what I was doing it. I don't know how to do it. And then she kind of suggests, well, maybe I need to be asleep to do it. Cue the whole dream connection, you know what I mean? Where, hmm. But also, she needs to be asleep to do it. Fever? But th then he's like, okay, well, you know what? I'm here with you. You can practice. And she's like, oh my god, practice? <laughs> what a concept. So yeah, after like the confusion and the rejection of the previous chapter and everything that happened up to that point, she finally kind of accepts like, you know what? It's okay to be a little bit different. Character development, let's go. Overall, this is a really cute chapter, you know? It, it's a lot of dialogue, but I almost wanna say the writing quality improved. Just a little, not a lot, just, just a teensy little bit. It's still not professional level quality to me. I know I'm not talking about that very much in these, but uh, it definitely has gotten better somehow. It feels like it's flowing more, maybe. Like there's less redundancy in the writing it's actually moving forward. <laughs> or maybe it's just because I'm more invested. I don't know. I, I also read it in the order of I read the web uh, tune first and then the web, web novel. So I was like in the in the groove, you know, I was like, oh yeah, let's see what they have to do in the web novel. So if you're also reading it, I recommend doing it in that order. I will say I did not see the fog thing coming. Like I thought that she was creating the fog or something like that. I did not think that she was the fog, so that caught me off guard. I don't know if Webtoon Suba, Suha has that ability or not, but I'm interested to know um, because they are a little bit different. A and I do want to say that although Heli does seem to like her in both the Webtoon and the web novel, it does kind of feel like that devotion attraction aspect is not as present in the web novel. Um, I, know I, I know I said that maybe they broke up the fight because of it or something like that like that, but I almost feel like it's not really like a major factor or it's not a major ability the way that it is in the web tune. By the way, if I pause between web tune and web novel every time I say it, it's because I have to think about which one it is because they both start with web. Um, but yeah, so let me know if you think Suha's powers are going to be different or if they just haven't been discussed yet. Comments. Um, when Unhyphen spoke about linking the two worlds, I always assumed they meant the world of life and the world of death because they are part of both. Now I'm questioning if these two worlds actually refer to the world of vampires and the world of werewolves. In this case, it would make sense for Suha to link them. So, 
I like this because I kind of also assumed before, well, not exactly. I, I assumed it was linking the two worlds like actual different dimensions. However, I do think that Hybe tends to write one line with several meanings in line, usually at least two, sometimes three or four. Um, in this case, I think this line means four different things. It could be uh, the life and death. It could be different dimensions. It could be werewolves. And it also has to do with um, like their idol references, um, like linking fame with regular life or something like that, maybe. Or like regular people with regular... There's different ways to read it. Um, but they definitely have chosen specific lines with lots of meaning. Um, so yeah, I, to be honest, I never thought of that particular line with the connection between werewolves and vampires, but it does feel like that's going to be a major focus of this story, so I completely agree with that. So yeah, <laughs> that feels like it fell short after the like super long lengthy Choco, like ch chat, Choco chat. <sighs> um, but that's all I have on Dark Moon this time around. Just really enjoyed it. Yeah, A+. Plus. Let's talk about the Star Seekers. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> so <laughs> this time around, let's start with the web novel. So the web novel starts off with Viken going to the... No, wait, sorry. It's Sol. There's a typo <laughs> at the beginning of this chapter. It's mentioned twice that Viken is the one going to get the drinks, except then it actually is Sol because... That makes sense. Soul is Subin. Subin was the one who went into the hallway in the Eternally music video. Um, Wattpad, if anyone from Wattpad is watching this for some reason, which they clearly aren't because nothing else I've mentioned has been fixed, please fix this. It's like, how can you completely use the wrong person? Ah, I had already heard about this. But just seeing it in action, I was like, that's really bad. So the chapter starts off with Soul going to the vending machine down the hallway similar to the events of Eternally, except that it's like, it, in Eternally he was kind of like looking at something all suspicious, and this one, he goes out into the hallway because of a reason, it's not just that he was suspicious, um, and here he sees that same mint blue light again, and he's initially like, what the, am I dreaming? Like, is this a dream? And then he realizes that he was given the die, the 20-sided die, it's just like, in his hands now, which matches up with the ending of the Eternally Music video, where it's just he comes back and it's in his hands. So I'm not sure if this is supposed to be like the same kind of idea, series of events, because I do think that in Eternally, time got rewound, so only Subin was the one who experienced that whole event. It has to do with the water bottle falling. I think I talked about it in my Eternally video a little bit. Um, but Subin seems to be the only one who remembers that they went through all of that stuff, uh, if he remembers it. However, I am really sad that if this is supposed to be, like, what happened in Eternally, and it's supposed to be in the same timeline, I'm so sad, I want him to go back in time and see baby Hyuka! Anyways, I think similarly to Chaco, it's just, like, mm, supposed to be the same kinds of events, but it's not exactly the same, but it achieves the same result, except that we didn't see baby Hyuka, so that's kind of a disappointment. Anyways, he starts to get paranoid about like all the bad parts of the dreams because he had previously seen himself get the die in a dream. So he's like, oh shoot, if I have the die now, like, oh. Or he doesn't really say it in so many words, but that's what I'm imagining is actually going through his head. And he, he also starts feeling a little stressed because he can't tell anyone about it. And I'm so sad. Like he cannot tell anyone about it. Then it takes us to Magic Island, kind of. So it looks like this is the Magic Island that the boys in the webtoon expected their manager DK to like send them to, basically. Um, it is an amusement park and a research facility based in where magic is strong on Tuxum. And they're there to film some sort of reality show or something like that. Um, and they're just like, wow, what's the irony that we're a non-magical group going to Magic Island? <laughs> Woohoo! They don't still have their magic here, so I can reasonably say that I still think this is before the events of the webtoon. Just, just throwing that out there. I know that people are saying it's different, but I'm thinking like, mm, what if it's, what if it has to do with the rewind? Okay. I'm waiting for the rewinds. Uh, speaking 
of magic and Magic Island, though, Soul still has his die. He literally keeps it in his pocket, and he's like, do I have it? Yep. He's, like, constantly, like, thinking about it, I guess. And Eugene is, like, really worried about him. He's like, "You are you okay? Also, Eugene is thinking some, like, relatively concerning thoughts uh, regarding magic that um, I think is why he ends up becoming a target for the cat, like, in the Dooms Night. Uh, like, things like, oh, even if I had to pay for it or had to give up my life, like, I, I would do anything for magic kind of thing. So I'm like, wow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no wonder the cat targets you later. <laughs> they finish their like variety shoot and it's nighttime now and I think that this takes place in the Doom's Night because we kind of see something that makes me think of this in the Doom's Night where Subin comes out and he was like remembering these things which makes me think of how he's remembering it because he's holding the die a lot. Um, but they're also on Tuxtun Magic Island and there's a theme park behind them. So that's why I think it's probably a similar scene as we're seeing in Doom's Night. They mention that they're especially concerned about Blackwater um, and the effects that it's having on their manager who's late and he's never late, but he's clearly like feeling the effects, like negative effects of this substance, this black water. And then they mention like how the media is only discussing the positive aspects of the black water, like the fact that it's reduced the price of electricity. Um, and it's not like they can just go back to expensive electricity because power is probably like one of the more important commodities in the world you know <laughs> but that the media you know even though they're saying those things they aren't mentioning anything about all of the negative side effects that are happening because of the use of black water this ties into a theme that i think hybe is sort of mentioning a lot recently um i talk about it a lot in my previous video for Enhypen, which was the Blessed Cursed video, where they mentioned like a lot of things are commodified and the bad parts are hidden, you know? It, I don't know, it just kind of feels like that. Like they're definitely trying to say something here. TXT also mentioned, sorry, Star One, also mentioned that because of Blackwater, there's a lot of conflicts between nations, a lot of, um, a lack of empathy, I think. And I'm not, I'm not sure if they're talking specifically about corporate greed, which would fit into the previous theme I was mentioning, or if it's just like a lack of empathy is a like symptom of Blackwater. Which makes me think of vampires and how they don't have emotions in Dark Moon. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's both. Anyways, they also mentioned a black hole appearing. And it wasn't stated outright. But I think they sub subtly implied that black water caused it. Because it was like at the same time. You know what I mean? Anyways, the boys decide to hang out on Magic Island in the park for a little while and have some fun. And they're like, hey, let's go to the fortune teller. Here, there's a really accurate fortune teller here. And so... They head on over to the fortune teller's tent, and outside Sue, Soul, not Subin, Soul sees, um, like, the die that he's carrying on the sign up front, and he's like, whoa, whoa, I'm having a moment here. It just, it really captures his, his attention. And we don't get to see what fortunes the boys get here, although we do see it in the web tune, so... You know, but they might be different. I'm sure it'll be in the next chapter, so. There is a really weird interaction I want to mention between Viken and... The fortune teller. <laughs> so Viken accidentally like knocks a vase off and breaks it. Vase? I don't know. Vase vase. And he's like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. Was that expensive? And he's like, no, no, no it was like two dollars. And he's like, oh, okay. Like, I'll, I'll buy I'll buy it or whatever. He's like, okay, it'll be twenty dollars. <laughs> and Viken's like, what? <laughs> and he's like, well, if you didn't apologize and offer to buy it, I would have charged you 40 for it. <laughs> and so I don't know what the point of that scene was, but I thought I'd mention it because I don't know, maybe it's important. Maybe it's a character thing and we're supposed to like later recognize the fortune teller as someone else. I don't know. Um, I included it because it, it's very random and it stuck out to me as just a weird conversation. <laughs> Soul mentions he's like, oh, I like the atmosphere of this fortune teller even though he's literally scamming Bongyu $20 off of a vase that was apparently $2. <laughs> However, I do think that this like more lighthearted feeling separates this fortune teller from the fortune teller that we saw in the Frost music video. Again, it's probably because the Frost music video is in the timeline in the future. I think it has to do with the rewinds. Okay, anyway. Uh, and that was kind of the end. So, speaking of the webtoon now, so DK, their manager, teleports them to Magic Island. And at first they're like, oh, we must be near Tuxum. I can see 
the theme park, Magic Island, the same one that was in the web novel just now, in the distance, you know? And they're like, yeah, that's the theme park. We're familiar with that. But we also see their twisted tree that appears in the Magic Island music video, which means that they are on our Magic Island. And it's also similar to like the blue hour music video, I think, where they're on the one side, you know, and then they kind of like lift up the veil in the blue hour music video. And then there they can see in the distance like, oh, there's the the real theme park, not the fake one that's been painted. I feel like because that's a that it almost feels a little bit symbolic in that sense. Like, oh, yeah, we're here on our magic island, but there's that magic island over there, too. Bongyu or Vikin <laughs> is unable to get the leaves off of him totally. And he's like, what the heck? Obviously, we know that this is probably because he's a tree spirit. He just doesn't remember or isn't aware of that quite yet. And again, this is probably happening because they're on the real magic island. He's still mostly human looking though. He's just, it's just the leaves are like persistently on him throughout this whole chapter, which I find incredibly amusing. <laughs> Poor Vken, he has to suffer, but. <laughs> Anyways, again, to match this chapter with last, they also spot a fortune teller's tent. It's just kind of sitting there and they're not sure what it is actually, but they walk in and it's fortune teller's tent. Although it does also feel a little bit different from the Frost music video, but it also feels a little bit different from the web novel. First, it is daytime, which in both Frost and in the web novel, it was nighttime or presumably close to nighttime. Um, and then second, if you remember my Frost theory, I thought that they had rewound time a bunch, right? As I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but like, I think that this is like the first time that they go there and then they rewind time and maybe even forget about it. I don't know. It's just something to consider. And it might also be why there's a difference between this and the web novel and Frost obviously. Anyways, the fortune teller here is like, oh, you must be here to learn your true names. And this is a D&D &D thing. If you aren't aware, true names are kind of one of those things where it's like, well, I guess it's also just a fantasy thing. But if you know your true name, you have more power over yourself. And if other people learn your true name, they can control you. Varying degrees of control. But essentially, that's kind of what it is. It's like, basically, a word that describes your entire essence just wrapped up in a name, your true name. <laughs> but here she likens it not just to a name, like a true name, but actually their fate. So their true name determines their fate. Bongyu goes on and he's like, oh, oh, this must be related to our magic. Like, what is our magic? That's what I want to know. And so she's like, okay. Uh, so she brings down the tarot cards, same as like what we saw in the Frost music video, um, although it is significantly less frightening looking. <laughs> so the boys see their true names. So Soul sees, um, who over on my Discord server, everyone kind of thinks is probably a depiction of the mythological figure named Cassandra. Uh, this was a woman of Troy, and she was said to be gifted with the ability to see the future, just like Soul. And just like Soul, she was also cursed with the uh, fact that no one would ever believe her. <laughs> so that fits nicely with what we've seen um, with Subin or Soul in the past, like in the concept trailer for Eternity, for example, where it seems like no one is listening to him, no one can even hear him or just ignore him. But also in this depiction, we see she's holding what looks like a glass bead over her head, which we saw in Frost. Um, and and I'm, I'm very excited about that. Eugene sees a warrior with horns brandishing a spear, which again, just like Frost. Viken, again, sees an elaborate box, just like Frost, which he then later compares to Pandora's box, which was part of my theory in the Frost music video where I did the breakdown for that. So good to know I was on the right track. <laughs> Paho sees himself hanging upside down, kind of wrapped up like a bat, which is interesting. And Avis simply just sees angel wings or maybe white bird wings. I don't know. I don't know how this ties into their powers like the magic question that bong Yu or viken asked um so if you have any ideas about that you can let me know like is it tied to specific elements it's like for example because taho was hanging over a body of water does that mean that his has water but he almost looked scared of the water <gasps> probably because it was black water anyways <laughs> belated realizations but like does that have something to do with it or maybe is it somehow telekinesis i can't see that being fire in that case and i i don't understand like how would would a box somehow be telekinesis because it's never ending 
Although I don't think it's never ending yet. So here's the thing. Like, I, I don't know for, I have no idea how it ties to their powers. Um, in terms of their fate though, I think that this is the, the, again, adding to the fact that this might be a separate timeline, like an early timeline, because it's not bad yet. The Frost music video had everything kind of cursed and twisted, and it was kind of like sinister, like everything ended badly. But that did not happen here. It was, it felt like really light and nice, kind of, I mean, confusing. Don't get me wrong, but I think it's supposed to be confusing, uh, just in general. Um, but. Like, it didn't feel evil. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if evil is the right way, like word. But I feel like this person really wanted to give them their true names and their fate. So if your true name changes, does your fate also change with it? Anyways, the tent disappears. Tahoe sees a book on the ground. The magic book, the same one that they have a couple times in the music videos, and I don't think he grabs it, but he definitely notices it. He might grab it. I don't know. If he does, it. it's not shown, um, but he might have picked up the book. It might be in his possession, um, which, if they do rewind time, might be why he's inclined to steal the book in the Frost music video as well, and they start talking about the true names and their, their, what they saw, which is a really dumb thing because even though they don't know what true names are like we know that that's bad <laughs> like because remember knowing someone's true name gives you control over them yikes <laughs> oh maybe that's why they want the book like the book control your can, can change your fate you know what i mean Anyways, it was a dumb decision to talk about it, especially because they're literally attacked by an anti like seconds later, Zub Zubin's like attacked by all these vines, which I guess is a water bending thing. Water bending? It's a water power thing. <laughs> and he also just calls the rest of them useless, which is just rude, honestly. Like, come on, first of all, Avis has powers now. He's not useless. <laughs> and neither are the others. They're also not useless. But yeah, um, also how the heck did that guy apparently track them because didn't DK just like teleport them to Magic Island like directly from like a, a street in the middle of somewhere was he did he see them fall from the sky and he's like oh, it's those boys I better go catch them <laughs> I'm just wondering I hope they answer that because I'm very curious anyways they start getting attacked by him stuff happens we don't see Avis he is the only one with powers and he doesn't show up in this fight at all so I think something might happen with him in the next chapter because we you know it ends before we see the resolution but the major thing that happens here is that v ken remember he's the one who's like already partially transformed into a tree spirit with leaves all over the place here's a voice and it says do you need help should i give you a hand this is definitely the cat there's no doubt about it the dialogue bubbles are blue on the outside with green writing inside of it what do we know about the cat Blue and green eyes. Always blue and green. I bet, okay, there's many things that can happen, but I bet that if Bomgyu doesn't make a contract right here, he's gonna start manifesting his powers in the next chapter. However, it also like closes in on his eye a little bit. Like one of his eyes has like a reflection in it. And the last time that we saw this that I can think of is in the concept trailer for Frost at the end where they're frozen and Moa in the reflection appears in Yeonjun's eye. So I wonder if Moa is here like protecting them too because that appears after he hears the voice. I mean, it's kind of all sort of in the same frame, but like we see the voice text first and then we see Vikan with the eye. So I think that this can go a number of different ways. Bomgyu can make a contract with the cat and it wasn't actually Moa, it's the cat and Bomgyu makes a contract with the cat and that's bad for him. But then he could manifest the magic because of the cat and fix the situation. So situation gets fixed, sort of, but also problems. Two, uh, he can not make a contract with the cat and manifest the powers on his own because it is a dire situation, which DK said they needed to trigger in order to actually get their magic. Three, I could see Moa stepping in to try and influence or fix the situation in one way or another. I assume if that happens, Moa will be using Avis because Avis has not been shown in this chapter, like I said, or like this part of the chapter, and he's the only one who can use magic that is not soul. However, it's possible that a Avis won't have to use his powers and won't have to like essentially reveal himself as being someone who can use magic now 
if V can develop towers and uses it. So then Avis will be like still secret. And I actually think that might be the case because um, Kai is associated with the word lucky several times, uh, most prominently when he's Baby Huka. <laughs> In the Eternally Music video, his shirt says Lucky on it. So I do wonder if maybe that is counted as Lucky, like, because they won't tar target him, necessarily? I don't know. I think any of those are possible, and also that something completely different could happen. Because <laughs> like I said, Avis is still off to the side. He can just act on his own if he wants to. We know that he can do water magic, which I think is what this guy is using to control the plants. So, he can help out. Um, he can counter the vines or whatever. We haven't seen him in the battle yet. But also, this is about Vikin, and I do think that they're going to bring Vikin and his powers into it. He's going to manifest something. Um, I also think Vikin can control plants, so him using vines, I mean... I don't know, there's lots of different ways <laughs> that this thing can go about this. What do you think is going to happen? Because, oh, I'm so excited! Every week, I'm just like, oh my god, I can't wait for the next chapter! <laughs> But I'm glad it doesn't come out any faster because these videos take like literally hours to write and then record and then edit every week on top of everything else. So thanks for spacing it out at least. Let's read some comments. Only Subin is the intelligent guy in the story. Where Why are all of them believing DK? This is nothing important. I just wanted to say thank you for agreeing with me. <laughs> yeah, Subin. Subin's the smart one, but again... That Cassandra curse, you know what I mean? He's cursed to the, no one will believe him. He, his warnings will come true and no one will believe him. Tragic. DK stands for the cat. Yeah, that's better than mine where I was thinking DK Donkey Kong. But yeah, no, maybe the cat or associated related to the cat. Again, that wasn't particularly important. I just found it funny. I think Avis being able to use only water magic hints to the fact that they need to be together for their magic to be the strongest, as only then can they summon all of the powers of the elements to win against the antis and save the world. I agree. And it also ties into a theme where it's like you have to discover yourself before you can like integrate with other people kind of thing because yeah they do need to discover their magic in order to come together because they have to understand themselves first because that's how they can use magic in this sense before they can come together as a group. Um, I do wonder how this ties into like the whole star song and the singing thing because um, we haven't really mentioned, I haven't mentioned that yet, but I do wonder, like, how that has to do with it. Um, because I know that them all singing together in the Dooms Night is what defeats the dragon. When all of their powers mix together, does it create the ability to do, like, the star song thing? I don't know. Something to think about. Maybe DK has a dual character. He is the manager, yet at the same time part of Blackwater, but it would be a big plot twist if he's actually good and just undercover in Blackwater, or someday he will save them. I agreed with this. I liked this comment. I said, to be honest, I kind of want him to be a Blackwater double agent, uh, where he's actually on the side of the boys, or I could also see him, like, making a switch. Like, he's like, actually, I do like these boys, and I'm changing sides. <laughs> um... Like, he's too obviously the villain to me, so I'd love if he was like, you thought that I was the villain? Nah, I'm on your side. Like, he's actually trying to help him. I, I kind of paraphrased my... But it was my writing, so it's fine. Anyways, <laughs> um, that's that's it. That's all I've got for you this week. Um, Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed reading this chapter with me. Chapter 4, by far my favorite chapter so far. Uh, for all of the stories. Like, just all around. Good job, chapter four. <laughs> you, you did great. Wow, I have so much energy right now. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up. Uh, comment below with your thoughts. Uh, which story are you enjoying? Did you like this chapter as much as me? And please make sure to subscribe if you haven't already and if you're enjoying these. Uh, it really helps me out. And then make sure to turn notifications on as well so that YouTube tells you every single time that I post a video. Of course, all of my social media and my Discord server is linked in the description below. And of course, I want to give a shout out to my patrons over on Patreon. Thank you to Rally Carr, Alicia S, Lame Game Hero, Savage 96er, Amanda Strickland, Jade, Megan Muir, Sharn Hoy, Hypenating, Amberly Smith, Danielle, Hoi Hoi Sato, Chris G, Arlene, 
Erin M. Tema, Aubrey 0904, Megan Simmons, and Soika. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for your support. As it is, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay sunny, my friends. Bye!